Hello, Internet. Roto World's Josh Norris here with another episode of the Roto World Football Podcast Nine Game Preview Edition. The here big with one. Winks That's and right. John Daigle. Fellas, how we doing? Doing good. Daigsies. Two weeks on the injury report for you. I know, still, still limited, but uh, we're fighting back slowly. What's the prognosis? Uh, it still hurts a lot. Okay. We are still taking care of the shoulder, and it may be more serious than we thought. But it's okay. We're halfway through the season. I'm good enough to play. I'll be probable probably every week from here on out. Like how serious? Are we talking like shoulder replacement here? We, it's not at, shoulder replacement. At 30-ish like, years old? It's not shoulder replacement. We may have to take a couple weeks out of the office off to get sh- off-season shoulder surgery, though. Oh, is that like a WebMD Daigle diagnosing himself? It's, uh, I mean, <laughs> I went to the doctor yesterday. It's pretty bad, though. Okay. It's, we're not doing well. I really should not joke about it. No, but... it's fine. It's, it's, like, it's just like a, I, I write fantasy and talk about fantasy for a living, and we're talking about me having sh- off-season shoulder surgery because that's a real thing. I can't get it done until the off-season, so. It's from being this close to your monitor at all times. Probably, yeah. Just posture. All right. Uh, like I said, today is our game preview episode, one of our favorites of the week. Uh, we'll touch on nine game six with the three of us. We'll add in Roto Pat later on for another three of his own. Again, if we don't touch on your team, that's your fault for rooting for a bad team. Uh, it's a great slate this week and a really, really fun uh, section of games. Let's start off with the Philadelphia Eagles at the Buffalo Bills. 45 total in this one. Uh, Bills as one and a half point favorites. Philly enters this game, three and four Hayden. Buffalo Bills are five and one. You know, prior to the season, we certainly thought that Philly had the, one of the most talented rosters in the Definitely. NFL. That certainly is not coming to fruition no. seven games into the season. Yeah, it starts with the defense, and I also think it starts with Deshaun Jackson being gone. The deep passing game is completely non-existent right now. We need him back. I don't think he's going to be playing this week. Um, and then against Buffalo's defense, it's just going to probably be more struggles. It is a tough spot against Buffalo's defense, but... I kind of like the offensive matchup for both Zach Ertz and Dallas Goddard if they lean on them too. Um, we discussed on Monday why Goddard has been an option, and over the last month he's been tight in 10 for fantasy. But, but Ertz, who's been tight in 7 in that stretch, he is due for positive touchdown regression in a bad way. I mean, this is the guy is still number one among all tight ends and targets, um, number two in red zone targets, and yet only one touchdown on the season. Mm. So that's the person I'm most interested in in this matchup for the Eagles offense. I'm a little nervous about this Bills offense, to be perfectly honest with you. Why so? Because last week, I mean, they didn't take the lead until the fourth quarter against the Dolphins. Mm-hmm. I'm a little worried about this Bills defense, to be perfectly honest with you as well, really? because... I don't think it's as good as a top five unit across the league. I think I gave it too much credit to start the season. Um, I mean, they need a defensive stand to prevent the Bills by going up by two touchdowns last week. They only put up uh, 10 points against the Patriots, as we know, with great defense. Uh, Only put up 14 points against the Titans, 21 points against the Bengals. I know that that was with Josh Allen in and out of the lineup. Mm -hmm. And he still has those moments of perfection despite the chaos, and John Brown has really emerged as a wide receiver one. But overall, I'm not sure 5-1 and one is really as indicative of how questionable this Bills team has been so far this year. Yeah, not at all. And before the season, we are talking about Josh Allen's scramble rates, and he's running the ball just as often as he was last year, but not picking up nearly as many yards, and that's probably um, one reason. That kind of lowers Josh Allen's ceiling um, in fantasy. But like as you mentioned, John Brown's – coming out five to seven receptions in every game, 50 receiving guards in every game, so locked in uh, wide receiver two. And, and now gets Jalen Mills, uh, who right. everyone thought would be an upgrade. <laughs> He's just a guy. Yeah. On this Philly side, we know last week against the Cowboys, it was a disastrous performance, mm-hmm. and they really put themselves in the own, their own hole, right? Like they dug it up and then they laid there. Um, it was early fumbles by Dallas Goddard. Um, I still think there's like magic in there from Carson Wentz this year. And I mean, he was an MVP candidate heading into the season. Mm -hmm. There's still half the season remaining, so we don't know what's happening. And you mentioned, Hayden, the loss of Deshaun Jackson. But the biggest thing is that this Eagles team ranks near the last in the league in generating a first down on first or second down. Like they're relying on magic on third downs, which in his basically his MVP season, Carson Wentz did that extraordinarily well. It's just not happening this year. Yeah, I think it's somebody to buy low on uh, after this matchup and just hope Deshaun Jackson changes things. Deshaun Jackson's a – it's an odd situation, though, because we really don't know anything. He continues not practicing. We haven't seen him since week two. That was six weeks ago. Like, he's been gone a month and a half, and we're just mentioning it as if he's going to come back every week. I kind of wonder if that still goes on and on and on, if they go back and revisit Robbie Anderson. 
because you know they, the team tried to trade for Robbie Anderson mm -hmm. last year during the trade deadline and with the Jets really stinking right. again yeah. this year if they do want to deal someone like Robbie Anderson. That's I, an intriguing that, trade. That would be a, a possible, and they're very banged up, the Eagles are. I mean, it's only Wednesday's practice report that we have, but Jason Peters, Lane Johnson, Timmy Jernigan, Nigel Bradham all out. On practice they on could practice. also shoot for Chris Harris uh, because they they Please. believe and maybe maybe they're right I'm not sure they believe corner is their only weakness yeah after the Bills the Eagles have the Bears the Patriots the Seahawks it's a pretty difficult for that's a tough one yeah right now again they're just three and four all right next up New York Jets at the Jacksonville Jaguars actually at home the Jaguars are four and a half point favorites a total of 41 in this game. Uh, Hayden, how are the Jets going to get over this Monday Night Football loss, which you talk about disasters of performance, about the worst we've seen so far this season? That might have been the worst quarterback performance I've seen. Mm -hmm. Just, I mean, no answers at all. And the issue is, is this the blueprint? Just Max blitzing, making him uh, see ghosts like he did? And that, that's my biggest concern here. But the schedule's so soft, I'm, I'm hoping he can start figuring it out. And we talk about it every week, Daigle. Like, Jacksonville's defense just isn't what it was, what it used to be. They are three and four in the season. The Jets are one and five. But this blueprint, like you mentioned, yes, that's possible. But I also feel like the Patriots are kind of the only team that can all out blitz, zero blitz, and have effectiveness down, down in and down out. Before swapping him, Jalen Ramsey, of course, had the quote-unquote back injury. So he's been out for a month. Right. And I know you and I uh, casually do the football talking thing and be like, they're bad. And I started looking, and I was like, I know they're bad, but, like, why don't the numbers pop? Like, why does it say this past month without Ramsey, they've allowed only 250 passing yards per game, and they still have a median pressure rate, so they're not reaching the quarterback either. And then I looked, and it's like, oh, the past month they've played Joe Flacco, Kyle Allen, Teddy Bridgewater, Andy Dalton. That explains everything. Now, is Sam Donald the answer to uh, penetrate this defense? I'm not sure because he looks so poor. However, if he's healthy, truly healthy and not limited from this toenail injury that's going on, um, I would think we can go right back to all of our Jets offensive players. Like, I would have preferred he throw two picks and 250 yards rather than four picks and negative six fantasy points. But, hey, it was a poor performance in a game we knew he was going to perform poorly. Correct. So I'm not, I'm not too worried about it. I still start him. Yeah, Twitter got at me because prior to the game, I was like, hey, if you just lost Mahomes, if you are worried about Matt Ryan, so on and so forth, Dak's on a bye, whatever else, um, then Sam Darnold's a nice option to have because we've talked about his schedule so much. It's Jaguars, it's Dolphins, it's Giants, it's Redskins, it's Raiders, it's Bengals, it's Dolphins again. That's great. I still think, despite that awful performance, he's still going to have weeks of top 12 quarterback play. Absolutely. Yeah, None of us were suggesting to play him on Monday Night Football. In these coming weeks, unless something crazy happens this week, we are advocating playing him moving forward. He was still taking shots downfield. Yeah. And just the fact he was trying to go downfield, that's a positive sign for me. We, we said sit Robbie Anderson. Robbie Anderson wasn't going to have a good day anyway, so right. we're not worried about how he disappeared. Um, I, I do genuinely have no fear in going right back to Darnold this week. What, what made me more nervous than, I guess, him seeing ghosts? Uh, no. What did me have me nervous was him seeing ghosts. What didn't was how he was feeling immediate pressure because there was actually pressure there. And the their line is bad. <laughs> the, plays, the plays that worried me were the ones when the offensive line actually had blocking up front and he was still forcing passes down the field and into coverage. Well, you see him, he, he gets his footwork all, all... That's just who he is. Yeah, and just off-platform. Off That's the way he was at SC, and it, it works sometimes, and sometimes you get sloppy with all that stuff, and then you start airmailing air it. Chris Herndon possibly back this week maybe possibly back wait and see and yes Ryan Griffin has been an afterthought despite continuing to play over 90 percent of their snaps so but as we know last year they showed rapport together when on the field together so I do you know Chris Herndon if he's back sure right. why not with Jacksonville's side of this Leonard Fournette has 25 plus touches in four straight games mm -hmm. um, a couple weeks ago against the Saints Gardner Minshew looked Absolutely awful. Uh, he bounced back against the Bengals, but the Bengals were without like three of their starters in the secondary. And to a lesser extent. He kept the game alive with his legs, but right. it was still not what we saw the first month. And you mentioned blueprint of possibly how to defeat Sam Darnold. I'm worried again that the Saints showcase that against Gardner Minshew with two safeties up top. Uh, really taking away DJ Chark on the outside. And this Jets defense, despite them being one in five, you might think I'm nuts for saying this. I think it's arguable that they're a top 10 unit in the NFL right now. 
yeah, I mean, Jamal, Jamal Adams is going to make plays happen regardless. And I think with these, these NFL defenses, they're just going to keep attacking these young quarterbacks until they can actually start figuring these things out. So um, probably see a lot of the same thing. He needs also, and yes, these targets have come underneath, but he's been leading on D.D. Westbrook a lot the past couple of weeks, and I think it is because, and again, Taking Chark uh, away. underneath, six and a half a dot in that span. Um, I think it's because he's been needing to go in the shallow as opposed because he can't get deep. So, yeah. Every time you say shallow, I just think. What's uh, wrong with shallow? No, where you had no idea who Lady Gaga was despite going to three Lady Gaga <laughs> concerts in your brain. Uh, overall with this game, I mean, I, I would not be shocked if the Jets' offensive line just gets overwhelmed by the, the Jacksonville defensive front. But we will see. All right, next game. Seattle Seahawks at the Atlanta Falcons. Massive total in this game of 53 and a half points. Speaks to both defenses. Um, I mean, Seattle's obviously favored by three and a half on the road, but they're expected to score over 28 points. The Falcons themselves, Daigle, are expected to score 25 points. I mean, how bad Matt Ryan's ankle looked after that and how he hobbled to the locker room, mm -hmm. all indications are that he's going to play in this game. They believe he's going to play. I'm not so certain myself. But if he does, I think you start him because this is not a Seahawks defense you're worried about whatsoever. They still struggle in reaching a quarterback. Their secondary is still bad. Yes, they added Quandry Diggs, who everyone freaked out and was like, oh, the Lions are now tanking. No carry on Johnson, trade Diggs. Diggs was a bum. <laughs> like, I, know what, I know what Pete Carroll said, that, uh, that they couldn't believe Diggs was available, but he's just not good. And now they're just going to start him immediately. So, again, I am still not worried about the Seahawks defense. We need, though, Ryan to play for everyone else to be lifted up because if Schaub is right. under center, you know what's going to happen. Uh, this is a team now that has 14% of their targets available due to shipping Mohamed Sanu to the Patriots. I imagine, it may not work out like this, but Calvin Ridley has only been in the slot on 10%, less than 10% of his routes this year, whereas last year he ran 24% of his routes. And on those 24%, caught 19 of 22 targets thrown his way for 145 yards and two scores. If Sanu's absence now allows us to get Ridley for a projected career high of slot rate, that's great news. But again, we need Ryan in the under center. Yeah, so Mohamed Sanu had an 8 out of 6.9. I know that's great, but... I wonder if that means Julio Jones and Calvin Ridley's eight dots going to come down, or if, um, I mean, I think Austin Hooper's targets are already maxed out, but that, they were playing in the same part of the field as well. So um, we'll have to see. If, if Matt Schaub's in there, all these guys got, got to be ticked down, though. Yeah, that would. I mean, even with Seattle's defense being below average and well below average, um, I mean, Atlanta has gone four consecutive games without a sack so far this season on the defensive side of the ball. I mean, that's the first time that's, that's happened in the NFL since 2008, which is ludicrous. I just don't know how they slow down the Seattle offense at all, which we've talked about as a great offense, at least I think it is, despite Daigle last week. And I don't know how this happened. They only put up 16 points against the Ravens. Yeah, and you know who – um, this is the Seahawks we're talking about, but really quickly I want to hit on another Falcons player. You know who's, okay. dead? You know who's dead now if you, don't, if you didn't sell high already? Well, dead's a little – Okay, well, not dead, but, like, Devontae Freeman, like, you can't even play him. But yeah. he, he had three receptions, receiving touchdowns, and then we knew that was going to regress. But to regress to six yards and just, like, two targets, that was really bad. But the Seahawks offense, so here's the thing. If Schaub plays, we have seen this before. This is still a run-first offense, um, despite the fact that they are so good throwing the ball, in particular on first down. And – Against the Cardinals, they had no issue just scaling Russ back. That's mm -hmm. why Russ, that's the only game he's finished under 28 fantasy points prior to that Ravens performance. So if Schaub plays, I imagine it's a Chris Carson game. And you're not benching Russ, obviously. No. But you shouldn't expect probably even a top 10 performance from him. Really? Just yeah. because the game flow is going to get out of hand? I think he's still playing because... Yeah, I, I disagree. You still play him, yes. But if they put up points, then he's going to be very efficient early on. I don't know if they put up like. I understand the volume aspect. So what? What's points though? What like twenty-four to ten? I don't think he has a top ten quarterback performance. Sure, but you're banking on them having only like four possessions in that case because they might score every possession against. If Schaub the plays, defense. they're going to get like a two-score lead and they're going to run the ball heavily. Hmm. Yeah, I mean Vegas is projecting them for twenty-nine points right now, so. Uh... I think Russ is going to be we have another man. Daigle Vegas situation. We, we might. <laughs> um, yeah, and and finally here, the Seahawks defense, in order for them to really take it far, has to come together at some point. They were not able to get off the field in third down situations against the Ravens last mm -hmm. week. They would probably be able to do that against even Matt Ryan if he's on the field. All right. And Rashad Penny gone is, by Tuesday or no? 
Oh, I don't think he gets traded just okay. because, you know, know just Pete Carroll and John Schneider are like have the most optimistic <laughs> view of these players of all time. I love them. Um, it's just very wild. Even at the time, we all questioned the pick of a first round selection after Chris Carson and his rookie year, I believe. Yeah. And then ever since then, like, it just didn't make sense. It yeah. just doesn't make sense. Chris Carson's a much better football player. Yeah. I mean, 24 plus touches in four consecutive games, I believe, for Carson. I got one more note. DK Metcalf's a regression candidate. His red zone mm -hmm. targets and stuff through the roof, getting deep downfield as well, just has been barely missing these things. Leads wide receivers and end zone targets, I believe. So it gets one this weekend. All right, next up, Denver Broncos at the Indianapolis Colts. Colts at home, six-point favorites, 44 total in this one. As you know, the Broncos head into this game 2-5. and five. The Indianapolis Colts are 4-2. and two. Um, This Colts team, I mean, Frank Wright completely outcoached Bill O'Brien last week mm -hmm. yeah. in that victory over the Houston Texans. With that said... Hayden, I think this Broncos defense has come alive. I mean, it's, it's really morphed into a top 10 unit in the NFL, possibly. And I wouldn't be surprised if they do give the Colts some pushback this week. Yeah, and that's without their second best edge rusher. It's just Chris Harris is at the top of his game still. And that if he's locking up T.Y. Hilton, that's, uh, that's a problem for Brissett. Yeah, so let's talk about this Colts offense, though, because they continue, Josh and I, you and I, like, just threw this around a little bit because they are continuing to play above expectations, and I think it's because of Frank Reich. Yes, Brissett deserves credit, right. but the play calling is really what's got them there. However, I kind of paint this as a Marlon Mack game, if only because uh, Jacoby Brissett is playing out of his league inside the 10. Like, this is a team that has thrown at a 65% rate inside the 10, 70% inside the 5, and Brissett is banked on that for most of his touchdowns. Um, that is, like, double the next closest team inside the 10, inside the 5. So it's not something I think continues. I think it's something that regresses back mm. to league average. Uh, and as we know, Marlon Mack continues playing miles ahead, getting a majority of touches over anyone else they have, Naheem Himes included. So, uh, yeah, I like Marlon Mack in this game, especially if you think that it's the Colts in a two-score, like, runaway. Brissett is fourth in the league in touchdown passes this year. He's been good. He's been 14. really good, yeah. Uh, last week, I mean, a lot of it was clean pockets, and that's what is helped by mm -hmm. a great offensive line. Um, but just the intermediate and even downfield throws he was making last week against the Houston Texans, which is a bad defense, was fantastic. And he had a few where he really fit into tight coverage. Eric Ebron's one-handed touchdown in the back. I mean, this is a team, despite being super average offensively with personnel, super average defensively in personnel, might be one of the most well-coached units across the league. And that is showing that it creates an edge, right, Hayden? Yeah, I mean, they can beat any team in the AFC outside of the Patriots right now. So, wow. Yeah. On the Broncos' side, uh, Emmanuel Sanders dealt. We know that Cortland Sutton has had a real year two breakout mm -hmm. and was even more productive. Emmanuel Sanders. Daigle, is there any trickle down here to someone becoming actually relevant outside of Cortland Sutton now? Unlike Sanu, Emmanuel Sanders' absence is huge. He was number two on the team in targets and air yards. He leaves behind so much opportunity, and I would think that falls to someone who's already proven he can do it in the past and a receiver they drafted just last year in Deshaun Hamilton. You recall over the last month of the season last year when Sanders was injured, um, Deshaun Hamilton closed the year with eight and a half targets over his last four games. Yes, it was a different quarterback situation, but there is enough opportunity remaining with Sanders now gone that I would imagine Deshaun Hamilton goes wild in the slot. Um, and it's not like I'm predicting him as a wide receiver two or anything, but he's a flex play immediately as early as this week. Go ahead. Yeah, he, he was dead last in yards per route run. That's just because he was a body out there. They weren't even looking at him. Flacco's one, one or two reads, and that's it. Um, and he's not mobile enough to get out of the pocket. So Deshaun Hamilton comes into that second target role. Um, he's in play as like a wide receiver four. The only reason I predict this is a Marlon Mack game, though, and think the Colts get ahead, not only because they're outright coached better, but I do wonder if the Chiefs unlocked the blueprint for defeating the Broncos last week. It's not hard, right? Hmm. But anytime Philip Lindsay was on the field, they just sent an extra blitzer and reached the pockets. Like, the fact the Chiefs, who couldn't rush the passer with all and then were down two starting defensive linemen, still had no problem reaching Flacco, that's a major issue. And the Colts will just see that, and they're smart enough to copy that. Uh, before we move on to some more great games, uh, I want to shout out some people. Because some people is that why you're this... looking at your phone? Yeah, I wasn't okay. just being rude here. I, <laughs> no, I knew you were. I knew, I knew you were doing something. El Galcho left us a five-star review. We appreciate that. SWD left us a five-star review. A secret helper. Lots of 
Oh, no, that's not a good one. Um, <laughs> team Shinkle? That's probably my fault. Uh, no, we, we appreciate I mean, people have been complaining, we, uh, complaining about the audio, but I think the audio is great. We, we should it. We shouldn't. We did fix the audio, and also we shouldn't, but like we do read the comments, too. So even if it's constructive criticism, I swear we see it. And we do appreciate the reviews. I mean, yeah. it, it, the even feedback, bad ones. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't uh, appreciate it. Well, I don't want ones. bad ones. We work hard on this podcast. I appreciate so, everyone's opinion. So take like 15 seconds, tell one friend, and hit that little box and write review. Leave us a five stars. And it's really easy. You literally just hit five stars and that's it. It goes away. There we go. All right. Carolina Panthers at the San Francisco 49ers next up. A game of 6-0 and versus the 4-2 and Panthers. A small total, 41 and a half mm -hmm. in this game. Five and a half point favorites the 49ers are. Uh, we know the Panthers are coming off a bye. Four straight wins. Uh, Cam Newton was back at practice on a limited basis, but he is not going to play yep. in this one. Um, so... How is Kyle Allen going to fare against this defense, Hayden Winks? Well, his job's on the line. If this is it. If, if all the, the Cam Newton haters out here, you better be rooting for Kyle Allen on the road against one of the best defenses, getting after the passer, playing good in pass coverage. So, um, job's on the line here. We also um, have this Panthers team, again, coming off a of bye, four straight wins. Uh, the biggest issue early in the season was pass protection. And I think a lot of people point to that Cam Newton Tampa Bay Bucks game in the first and Thursday night football and say, wow, he was awful. Darrell Williams was awful in that contest mm -hmm. as well. And since then, they've used Greg Little at left tackle. He's still out with concussion. Dennis Daly, who was like a six-round rookie, has stepped in as left tackle and played and improved there as well. But that entire offensive line is going to be contested and tested um, against this team that has like seven first-round picks in their defensive front. And so Norv Turner and company are really going to have to script – and create plays that on first reads, it makes Kyle Allen's job very easy. It's a very salivating game, but not so much for a fantasy perspective. It's just a two good teams and great defenses going against one another. Yes, it helps if Trey Turner's back, but it's still... I believe he is. Okay, yeah. Uh, and Greg Little still out concussion. Dennis Taylor will play left tackle. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's still just a... Just a tough matchup against a team that may have Defensive Player of the Year on their side, um, definitely has Defensive Rookie of the Year on their side. Uh, yeah, it's going to come down to play calling. Like, How do they script Christian McCaffrey, who can do it by himself, yes, right. but it will certainly help if he gets some help. And we've talked about how good this 49ers defense is. Panthers not too far behind. Maybe they're on very different good. teams, but they've been fantastic. And this will test the 49ers offensive line as well. I believe Joe Staley is, has returned to practice on a limited basis. Maybe he does return at left tackle. And it's, it's pretty telling and amazing how well coached this team has been when they lose both starting tackles and remain undefeated in a league that creates a lot of pressure. You can take nothing from their game that they did last week, though, against the Washington Redskins. I mean, yeah. It was a mud bowl. Yeah. They it's 24 minutes nothing. on NFL Game Pass. Like, you could just knock it out really quickly. But what Kyle Shanahan has done is some self-scouting over the last week. They realize that, hey, we are rotating four wide receivers. Let's find one that we can trot out there on every single snap. I think Emmanuel Sanders plays over 70% in his debut for the 49ers this week. Yeah, the, the one data point that I was going off of was Antonio Brown ran 17 routes in his debut when he got acquired by the Patriots. But even, I don't think we should be looking at this from a snap perspective, because even if he's out there for 50% or 70%, whatever it is, the 49ers can scheme up plays for him where even if he's running a route on half of the snaps, that he's getting targets. And remember, Sanders' offensive coordinator in Denver was Rick Scrangelo, who spent the last two years of his career underneath Kyle Shanahan. What do you... What do you... Scangrello. Close. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I see the N and the R and the G just all, like, thrown together. Um, but no, let's talk about Sanders for a second. Because yeah, I think he's active and I think, as you said, plays quite a bit. Last year, in the slot, he spent 62% of his routes. This year, he's only been there for 31%. And that is where the Niners, I assume, will use him immediately. So he does have the history being a stud slot receiver. They, their highest slot receiver this year has seven catches. That's it. It's ridiculous. Jalen Hurd and Trent Taylor now, we are not expecting to be back November 24th at the earliest because they just had a few setbacks, reportedly. Hmm. Um, so they need Sanders to be available and useful immediately, and I think he will be. I think he's a wide receiver three in this matchup despite the defense. We, we can only view teams right now in week eight, but it's I'm looking at the 49ers schedule, and they basically face two yeah. defenses all year long. It's the Panthers this weekend, and then it's the Saints on December 8th. Jimmy Garoppolo has been forced to play like one game. Right. That's it. So the, here's my question. If, if the Panthers, and it's a major if, 
can slow down the running game, which is the foundation of this 49ers mm -hmm. offense. Is this the game where Jimmy Garoppolo has to carry this team offensively? Because yes. we've seen it from Aaron Rodgers. He's had to do it. We've seen it from Carson Wentz, Russell Wilson. These quarterbacks have had to do it. Jimmy Garoppolo hasn't yet for series at a time. And if that happens this week, it'll be very telling to see what the 49ers look like and respond to that. Yeah, I think their upside, like tied into the playoffs, still surrounds Jimmy Garoppolo. If, if they if they can't pass the ball, then they're going to struggle to beat these top NFC teams. And for fantasy, it's still a concentrated target tree. Even if Sanders is involved heavily, which we project, Kittle, Sanders, Breida, and Coleman. Right. And I know people see like, oh, Coleman last week, like season high in touches. Like he's now the lead back. Like remember Breida, as he usually does, it's just an evergreen note. He left and then came back. Like, Breed is still involved heavily in this offense. Breed only has one red zone carry this year. That's yes. a problem. I also want to point you guys to NFL. No, excuse me. I also want to point you to our NFL 30 <laughs> promo code. That's the better way of doing it. You're going to point them to Greg Rosenthal. Rotoworld.com <laughs> slash win or rotoworld.com slash GFS. If you need help just surviving your fantasy season, a little extra work that can be done to help you out, uh, that's our season pass. Again, rotoworld.com slash win or the DFS toolkit, and Daigle has Building Block Show with Ian Hardis later on. Right after this. RotoWorld.com slash coffee. DFS. Use promo code NFL30 for 30% off. All right, let's close out the three of us with the Oakland Raiders at the Houston Texans. Texans, six-and-a-half-point favorites here, 51 total. Massive line. Um, I mean, Hayden, Texans coming off a disappointing performance. Bill Brown out coach, like we talked about with Frank Reich. Um, Will Fuller out of this game. Kenny Stills replaced him. They just could not get it going against a Colts defense, yet they're now facing the Raiders defense, which is one of the worst in the NFL. Yeah, the Colts have kind of had Deshaun Watson's number. Like, not they're not completely shutting him down, but uh, he hasn't been Deshaun Watson against the Colts. And the Raiders, they're in the bottom 10% in passing defense D DVOA and passing or stopping fantasy quarterbacks. So I think it's a get-right spot for Deshaun Watson. I'm not worried. You, Go ahead. I, I do love Deshaun Watson in this matchup. My issue with this matchup and this total in particular, Houston can carry their weight. I don't think Oakland can carry their weight. Uh, how you attack the Texans is through their corners on the outside. And, yes, they just traded for Conley. Doesn't matter at all. Just a guy. Um, but Houston has allowed the second most receptions to their receivers. Oakland has targeted their receivers at the lowest rate in the league. And even if Tyrell Williams is back on the field, we know this offense flows through Darren Waller and, and? Josh Jacobs. And that's yes. It. Yeah, the running game. Josh Jacobs is a top ten running back in the NFL right now. He's great. He's very good. fantastic. Did you, did you rank him? I did read your number column. two. What number was he? Number two overall. Okay. Um, I am stunned that this Raiders team has a top 10 offense in DVOA. Yet it's exactly what you mentioned. It's Darren Waller. It's Josh Jacobs and a bunch of nobodies, a bunch of scrubs that, I mean, Derek Carr doesn't even throw the football to. Like, how? You were not going to expect to hear this, but the play calling is good. I know. Yeah, the Gruden's, offensive play calling is pretty good. Kind of good. He, <laughs> it's like Gruden is brought down by Carr, who, no matter what they scheme up, right. just won't throw to his receivers no matter what. What they need to do, and they're not going to do this, they need to go full Eagles and put Foster Moreau on one side 70% of the snaps. Totally agree. And Darren Waller the other 70%, and you just run two tight ends. Moreau has a little George Kittle in him. He has really? a little George Kittle you in him in terms funny? of being a great athlete. A good blocker, and yeah. it's growing into the receiving game. You know, it's, I, I, I was tweeting about Moreau, like, during the draft or something, and then uh, I had a call with so Evan Silva, and he actually, who that's that who he, uh, he's some guy, that's who he actually compared Moreau to during the pre-draft process Probably was George Kittle. Um, <laughs> Makes okay, sense. so I think it's a major game for both sides, though, because the Texans are 4-3, and three, the Oakland Raiders are 3-3, three and three, and for different reasons. Like, I don't think any of us truly believe that the Raiders are going to be in the playoff hunt. However, we think Texans absolutely are at four and three. But it's the playoff picture for the Texans. And the rest of the season, it's Derek Carr's job. I mean, the, the, the Raiders actually have a chance if Patrick Mahomes is sidelined. They're only a couple games back. That's probably what they're p pivoting to. But I think for the, for the Texans, is there another team in the AFC that can go into New England in the playoffs and have an, uh, enough upside to beat the Patriots. And I think I think Deshaun Watson has the best chance. Yeah, whenever you have Deshaun Watson in the field, you have a chance to win on Sundays. Yeah. And he has that magic in him. And really what their losses have come down to is if he connects in those big vertical shots or if he doesn't. I mean, the loss last week, they had a chance 
less than a minute to beat the Tex uh, to beat the Colts. They didn't do it a few weeks ago against the Panthers. He missed him like three vertical shots, but then you watch him against the Falcons and he hits him like seven of them. It really does come down to those one, two, three, or four plays, those big plays, if he converts them or if he doesn't. And I've seen some buzz that, oh, like maybe he struggles now without Will Fuller. People looking at historical splits, same as they did with Brissett, but again, completely different situation. Kenny Stills is not Demarius Thomas. Kenny Stills is a player who – uh, whose floor is arguably higher than Will Fuller's. And I, I don't, I don't want to get too crazy, but he might just be a better football player than Will Fuller, honestly. Um, maybe not as explosive, but the p deep passing game shouldn't struggle at all. Stills last week came in, played 94% of the snaps, ran around on 95% of Deshaun's watches, dropped backs. You start DeAndre Hopkins with the utmost confidence, who benefited greatly in terms of air yards without Will Fuller last week. And you start Kenny Stills on the outside with the utmost confidence. Kiki QT has the floor because they continue getting Darren Fells and Jordan Akins involved underneath, which takes away from him. But yeah, Stills and Hopkins are amazing plays this week. Time now to bring on Patrick Darty. It's Darty. You got it right this time. I've learned one thing this year, and it is how to say Pat's last name. Uh, Pat writes the rankings up on Roto World Go, and check those out if you have any lineup conundrums. Uh, Pat, the first game that you picked and wanted to discuss, again, this is a theme for you this year, talking about Kyler Murray, Arizona Cardinals, at the New Orleans Saints. Saints are nine and a half point home favorites in this one. Um, let's shelve Kyler for a second, Pat. And first, bring up Drew Brees because he says he is going to play. What would that do for the offense if Drew Brees does, in fact, play? I'm still a little skeptical Drew Brees is going to play. You know, he's saying he's going to play. Sean Payton has said more like he might be a game time decision, which, you know, you always just love with your quarterback. You want the quarterback position to be a game time decision. That's very good um, for your offense to keep everyone in suspense. Uh, I'm an, I mean, I'm not expecting much difference for the Saints. I mean, Teddy Bridgewater's been doing a pretty good uh, Drew Brees impression over the past three weeks. Uh, he's averaged 36 attempts over his past three games compared to 27 over his first three. So if Drew Brees comes back, it's not going to be like he's encountering a machine, you know, that fell out of calibration while he was absent. He'll be taking back over an offense that's been running really well in his absence. And uh, it kept Michael Thomas hot. Uh, he kept Alvin Kamara hot. He's going to be out, obviously, it appears. Uh Jared Cook maybe needs some reviving, but Drew Brees through one and a half games didn't show much chemistry with Jared Cook. So, but yeah, it's, it'd be an ideal spot for Drew Brees to return, even with Patrick Peterson back for the Cardinals last week, because this offense yeah, isn't in need of saving. Uh, Teddy Bridgewater has kept it moving. So, yeah, you mentioned Alvin Kamara potentially being out. And as we saw, Latavius Murray worked as a bell cow without Kamara last week. 32 touches on 65 of 78 offensive snaps. So whether Brees is under center or not, where do you have Murray ranked if he gets another start for Kamara? I have him in the top. I think I have him RB8, RB10. I've yeah. got him in the top 12 because, like you said, they didn't treat Latavius Murray any different than Alvin Kamara. I mean, 32 touches is insane, and that's not really unrealistic to expect a repeat against a Cardinals team that's not good against anything. That includes mm -hmm. the run. In a contest where uh, Josh says nine point, I've seen the Saints all the way up to ten and a half point home favorites. So I mean, the, the game flow, the game script could just be incredible uh, for Latavius Murray after he did it. You know, against a really good defense, a much better defense on the road in the Bears last week. So to me, I see no reason not to rank Latavius Murray as an RB one. Yeah, and you mentioned Jared Cook. I believe that he is hobbled right now, not practicing. It would kind of be, it would make sense that Alvin Kamara would miss this game because after this week, the Saints have a bye. And in fact, it would make sense if Drew Brees missed this game. I was going to say, exactly. Seems... Why don't the Saints apply that same logic right. maybe to their ancient quarterback right. and uh, get him a little more rest? Uh, Pat, the Cardinals are 500. They're 3-3-1. Three, three, mm -hmm. This is after, you know, maybe their best performance of the season for a long time being that second half. This is half after against... you wanted the whole regime tossed out following the Panthers game. Josh. Well, that's not exactly true. I did want to put Cliff Kingsbury on notice, but to be perfectly honest with you, Pat, he's done a great job in this running game. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's been fantastic. And it's not because this is a good run-blocking offensive line at all. It's not because David Johnson has been breaking tackles, but because of Kyler Murray's running threat and because of – these great schematic advantages that Cliff is doing in the running game, they're creating massive holes. Now, Pat, we know what Chase Edmonds did last week, and many times when a player on your bench has a great performance, you want to start him the next week, yet he's facing the New Orleans Saints. So what's your read on Chase Edmonds this week, Pat? Yeah, you know, everyone knows the reason the Cardinals hired Cliff Kingsbury was to establish the run. So it's 
really good he's gone out there and done that uh my read i mean chase evans what was the top number two number three overall running back last week i've got him in the top 12 this week uh you know, the Cardinals signed Alfred Morris and Zach Zinner this week. That signals, you know, DJ Foster was hurt last week too, but the signing of those two running backs, you know, obviously it shows a distinct lack of faith in David Johnson's availability. And Chase Edmonds probably isn't going to get 140, 150 yards from scrimmage uh, against this elite Saints defense, but I mean, there's going to be drives to finish. There's going to be goal line carries. Uh, his one, His odds of getting at least one touchdown are extremely high. And as you alluded to, in this potent rushing attack and in this kind of scoring environment, even when they're 10 and a half point dogs, you know, we're expecting some scoring opportunities for the Saints. There's going to be a lot of drives to finish. Uh, so I, I think I see no reason. Basically, the Cardinals have become like uh, whoever is the starting running back for this offense. How could you not rank them as an RB1, basically? Uh, so even in this tough environment, I've got Chase Edmonds in the top 12. All right, let's pivot to the passing game. Larry Fitzgerald's kind of on a downturn right now. Can we expect anything from him, or is this just age kicking in? I don't. Hey, is it, this this is. I'm assuming this is Adam Levitan. If we're making fun of Larry Fitzgerald's age, and uh, not surprised either from the youngest member of the staff to be talking about how old uh, Larry <laughs> Fitzgerald is. Um, just very ageist, Hayden. But uh, no, I mean, listen. The one thing Fitz had done every every game this year until last week was hit his floor. And he didn't do it one catch last week, but you would like to think Larry Fitzgerald is going to get at least five to six catches in the Superdome uh, against the Saints defense that formidable, formidable as it is, uh, PJ Williams, I believe is still on suspension. Uh, Patrick Robinson's banged up. So they do have some injury issues in the slot. Um, Larry Fitzgerald has not even hinted at a ceiling since week two, but I think he should return to his five to six catch floor this week. Yeah. And Christian Kirk might be coming back. That would help a lot for the six and one Saints here. Um, Kyler has only been pressured on like 17% of his dropbacks the past three weeks. I mean, that speaks to some of their competition. But also, I, I, Kyler's just been great, man. Like, Kyler has been, mm -hmm. he didn't have to do a lot this past week, and it's because against the Giants, again, Cliff did a great job of orchestrating a running game. But what Cliff hasn't done is open up the passing game, especially with outside receivers. I'm not saying Kirk will play on the outside, but maybe with him and actual some talent in that receiver group, Josh maybe Gordon. they actually can create something um, <laughs> offensively win the passing game. Um, all right, Pat, moving on to a very good game. The Cleveland Browns at the New England Patriots. Uh, Cleveland Browns, two and four uh, after just a wonderful offseason, by all accounts. And now they're headed to Foxborough to take on the Patriots, seven and zero. Oh and 12 and a half point favorites in this game. Uh, the Browns are coming off a bye, Pat. The Patriots have not just a good, not just a great, but a historic defense. So a lot of people, again, spent early draft picks on the Browns. So how are they gonna use them against the Patriots? Hey, wh where would you guys put the odds that Baker Mayfield gets Darnold uh, this Ooh. week? Uh, that's, uh, is that too early to make that a verb? Um, Ghosted? You know, I, dry, I know you love when I uh, repeat my own Twitter jokes. It's the Patriots' final game of the preseason before they begin the regular season <laughs> against the Ravens next week. Um, you got some chuckles up from these guys. I think I've heard all your jokes before, so I you I, I ignore your uh, tweets because they come I every five to, minutes. I have to. Laugh. <laughs> <laughs> so the Patriots—they've been literally historically good. Uh, we know it's coming against a joke of a schedule, but this would count as part of that joke of a schedule from the way we've seen the Browns play. I mean, if there's a saving grace for the Browns is that this overwhelmed coaching staff has thankfully had two weeks to prepare for its toughest game of the entire season. And, you know, we have, it's not like it's been, like it's never happened for Baker Mayfield this year. He did rip uh, the the uh, Ravens defense that was looking weak then is improving now. Uh, Odo Beckham did have a hundred yard game before the bye. There's, there's not no hope here. And as bad as Baker Mayfield has been this year, he actually does represent one of the better quarterbacks the Patriots will have faced all year. So there's not zero reason for hope, but I mean, I I'm not I'm not playing Baker Mayfield in two quarterback leagues this week. I'm not taking a Baker Mayfield shots in DFS. Maybe John has more sophisticated reasoning where maybe we could use Baker Mayfield in some DFS spots. But I mean, it's just an indisputably awful spot uh, for the Browns. And uh, yeah, Patriots D gonna be a millie maker again. Yeah. So, I mean, at some point, it feels like that Odell Beckham has to get going, Daigle. Like, at some point, when is that going to happen? Because there's too much talent for this. And you feel like during a bye week, some self-scouting some self has to take place. 
And if there's ever a player to get more involved, but not force it, because I feel like they have forced it. Like, I'm talking myself in circles here, but I feel like the Browns have done that play calling wise throughout the year with Odell Beckham as well. It just comes down to when Baker gets involved, right? Like, and Baker's finished in the top 25 at his position only twice this year. And once was insane. B- before he went to the bye because he fluked into a 10 yard rushing score. Like, Baker's <laughs> been terrible for fantasy. So much so, like, even in two quarterback leagues, you can just drop him almost. But what's wild is prior to the bye, they had a 20 to 6 lead on the Seahawks. Yeah. Like, they were dominating that game in the first half and then just completely tanked it. In the second half, like we, we would have a different feeling of a three and three Browns than we do of a two and four Browns heading into the bye and heading against this Patriots team. Uh, let me ask you then, because if we think the Browns aren't going to perform well in this game and we we don't think they're going to perform well, where do you have Nick Chubb ranked then? Because he's clearly still an opportunity based RB one. It's just the matchup is extre- and game script is extremely poor. I know it, Nick Chubb represents a very difficult rank this week because uh, the game script has been bad almost every week, and yet he has been stunningly consistent and posting great raw numbers, great average numbers. And he's like, I've said this before too, but he's like the reason why the phrase lone bright spot exists. I mean, he has just been crazily consistent considering how bad the offensive line been, has been and how bad the skill talent around him has been. So I, I don't I, I can't you can't like fade him out of the RB two ranks, but I, I have him ranked as a high end RB two, which makes me very nervous. But it's almost like the Browns sometimes are reaching, like that. Remember that final Chip Kelly season in San Francisco, where no matter how they were constantly behind by two or three scores, but they just never stopped running. It almost sort of feels like the Browns have gotten like that with Nick Chubb, or it doesn't really matter if they're in comeback mode or not, where they're still going to get Nick Chubb his carries. And he's really yet to have a dud, which is just shocking because of how many duds the overall offense has had. So I do have him faded lower than where I have him, you know, for a less forbidding matchup, but I still have him ranked as a high-end RB2. I know we need to wrap this game up, but we haven't talked at all about the Patriots. We have to talk about the Patriots, yeah. Because um, they made a move this week for Mohamed Sanu. And before that move, I I sat back and thought, what if their top – Offensive option, Julian Edelman got injured, missed some games. I mean, their offense hasn't been good, and I don't think that's on Tom Brady, Daigle. I think he's actually played decently well, above Mm. average, (laughs) certainly. But I would say that now Mohamed Sanu gives them a middle-of-the-field presence. They were really lacking, so they wouldn't have to rely on Jacoby Myers and this gunner dude who's a special teamer. Right. Like, this gives them another wrinkle to the offense that, I mean, for them in this window with Tom Brady – finishing his career possibly with the Patriots is the time to add a role player like this. So I'm going to, I want the rankings where you have all these guys, Pat, but I will say because I am skeptical on Sanu's involvement, because remember this team hits their buy in week 10. I wouldn't think they integrate him fully until they have 14 days to do so. But that's not what they did with Antonio Brown. And I know Mohamed Sanu isn't Antonio Brown. Yeah, completely different. No, there's very little difference between Antonio Brown and Mohamed Sanu. But I mean, I, I don't think they make this move to say, hey, we need two weeks to get second someone round going. Or two. Right. I, I think they make this move knowing, okay, talk about self-scouting. The Patriots are the best in the league at that, knowing that they will ask him to do certain things that he will get involved immediately. I'm not saying, like, go out and start him, and a lot of people are going to want to, but do I think he's going to be a factor in this game against the Browns? Absolutely. He's gonna. Pl- I I more agree with John. I, I despite they force they when they forced in Antonio Brown. I do think it'll be kind of a a learning experience week for Mohamed Sanu. Obviously, they think he's the kind of player who could pick it up immediately. Otherwise, they would not have surrendered a second round pick for him. But especially with that buy on the horizon, yeah, I'm not expecting a full plate for Mohamed Sanu this week. I do have him ranked as like a high end wide receiver four. And I just have to get in one note on Tom Brady, by the way. Uh, He's averaged 43 attempts over his past three starts and is still, quote-unquote, just the QB8 during that time. Uh, Tom Brady has been very concerning. And as the schedule finally does start to tighten up here following this week, I'll be very interested to see if Tom Brady kind of retreats back to where he was in the end of last year was more in like the QB to tw- QB 20 to 25 range because he just hasn't looked that great from a real life perspective and he just hasn't been that great in fantasy either. Yeah, after destroying awful teams to start the season, they now get after the Browns, the Ravens, the Eagles, the Cowboys, the Texans, the Chiefs, so on and so forth. All right, let's close out today's preview pod with the Green Bay Packers at the Kansas City Chiefs. This is Sunday night football. Uh, the Chiefs are 5-2. and two. 
Uh, the Green Bay Packers are six and one. The total is 48. And right now, the Packers are four and a half point uh, road favorites. Pat, before I get to you, I want to ask Daigle this. Um, I'm kind of amazed that this game is still on the board because <laughs> it's a massive difference mm -hmm. if Matt Moore is at quarterback versus Patrick Mahomes. And right now, with this line, which one do you think the desert is leaning towards of which quarterback is starting? It is – well, I mean, I think it's still Matt Moore. I, it is such a – and this doesn't mean they won't do it, but it is such a mistake if they go to Mahomes. Right. I was actually kind of excited to see him gone for a few weeks because that also means his ankle heals over that time, and he comes back presumably with a clean bill of health. If they rush him back after we – visibly saw his knee pop out of place. And be seven, popped back into place. Seven on the days field. later. And he went like went into shock too. They have that still of him like grasping his head. Like they cannot <laughs> possibly play yeah. him in this game. I think it's just gamesmanship. Don't you like a limited basis taking fourth snaps an individual. Mm -hmm. Like I, I highly doubt he plays this game. Yeah, no way. Yeah, so Pat, on the Chiefs side then, you know, when Mahomes is in the lineup, we fire up Tyree Kill. We fire up Travis Kelsey. Sammy Watkins is returning this game. People might fire him up as well. How much does that change with Matt Moore at quarterback? For, for Tyreek Hill, it really doesn't change at all because he's the kind of – he's about as close to a quarterback-proof receiver as you'll ever see, especially in fantasy. I mean, Tyreek Hill is the classic. He needs one or two catches. Tyreek Hill can have a top-10 day in fantasy because – a lot of those times, one or two of those catches is a 60-yard touchdown, and we kind of saw that last week. It was more like a 30 to 40-yard touchdown, but I'm not I'm not fading Tyreek Hill in the ranks. I'm really honestly not fading Travis Kelsey either because, to me, it would make a ton of sense for a backup quarterback to, uh, you know, if you have an, a backup quarterback as an elite uh, target in the seam, it would make a lot of sense for me for him to lock on to Travis Kelsey. So I haven't faded Tyreek Hill in the ranks. I really haven't faded Travis Kelsey either. I don't really know what to do with Sammy Watkins. It would be very Sammy Watkins, obviously, to, to like blow up. Have a huge week. game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I haven't quite decided where I'm going to end up with Sammy Watkins yet. But I, you're fading the peripheral players. Uh, you know, Demarcus Robinson's canceled. Nicole Hartman canceled, obviously. Uh, you know, Byron Pringle has been long since canceled, Josh. And uh, yeah, I'm not fading the top two just because it makes a lot of sense for me to – Tyreek, it doesn't matter who the quarterback is. Travis Kelsey, I think, will be a focus for Matt Moore. What about the running backs? Could the Chiefs score enough to keep those guys involved? I think so. And it's, uh, you know, the Packers are uh, worse against the run than the pass. And they've allowed, I think, 10th or 11th most running back receptions. So, obviously, it would also make sense for the Patriots to, or the Chiefs to lean a little more on the run game this week and to lean a little more on their pass catching back, Damian Williams, who was basically fading – from flex relevancy until this week, I would probably have Damian Williams ranked as like the RB 40, 45 if Patrick Mahomes was starting this game. But with Matt Moore, I've got him back kind of in the flex, the 30 to 36 range. And I think it sets up yeah, a little bit for a, a bit of a Damian Williams revival. Really? Six and a half touches, 32% of the snaps the past two weeks. He's a believer. He's getting targets siphoned from Darrell Williams and carry siphoned from LaShawn McCoy. But it's, it's a backup quarterback, and backup quarterbacks do things like check down to the running back a lot. So, and I, I think there'll be – I think it'll be – Damian Williams will be a bigger presence in the game plan this interesting week. Interesting, because – Like I said, if Patrick Mahomes was under center, I, we were getting to the point where we had to fully fade – Damian Williams. I'm, I'm expecting a slightly different game plan from the Chiefs this week. I assumed that different game plan, though, would be LaShawn McCoy getting 15 to 20 carries because they're not going to give Damian Williams that many carries. All right. That is quite possible. <laughs> All right. I know we haven't talked about the Packers, but I feel like because of how injured the Chiefs are, like Frank Clark didn't practice on Wednesday. Chris Jones didn't practice on Wednesday. Kendall Fuller didn't practice. I mean, this, this is how I opened this game. But if Matt Moore plays... I think the Packers completely demolish the Chiefs, like Ooh, by 10 points. I, I absolutely so. believe yeah, so. Yeah, I wouldn't ever say that. No, I, I totally believe so because Aaron Rodgers is playing some of the best football of his career. Sure. That Packers defense has talent, enough talent, and enough pass rushers up front to cause a lot of chaos to a backup quarterback. I, I'm shocked that you guys think that this is going to be a competitive game with Matt Moore at quarterback and one of the worst defenses in the NFL in the Chiefs. In Arrowhead with sure. 10 days of rest with Andy, Andy Reid? Reed, Dude, yeah. I don't – I know. I think you're blowing this up a little too much. By more than exactly. a touchdown, so we the Packers lean into the bye week the narrative. So it wasn't a bye, but a mini bye is enough time for Andy Reid, the game plan guru, 
Matt Moore, he's going to come out here. He's going to look like Bart Starr. Again, he's going to look like uh, Aaron Rodgers' grandfather. As, uh, as someone who has lived with Matt Moore as a starting quarterback of his favorite team for years, Matt Moore is Matt Moore. He's still Matt Moore. <laughs> He wasn't even in the league last year. Like, you guys are giving way too much credit to the Chiefs I think you're right giving now. too little credit. Like, we need to meet in the middle somewhere. But before we yeah. go, we do – we seriously have to talk about the Packers receivers because do you think uh, MVS and Geronimo Miles took a step back to Lazard and Kumaro last week because they were hobbled? Because Lazard – I just scratched him off once we got word that NVS and Allison were healthy. But the fact is, Lazard still led this team in snaps, targets, and routes run. Yeah, it was a very confusing situation because Lazard and Kumaro both played more snaps than MVS and Allison. But then, of course, MVS led in yards because of his long reception. And Geronimo Allison had about as many receptions as Alan Lazard, Lazard and Kumaro. I'm thinking it was more just the weird injury situation. And this week, uh, well, this week it's going to get even more confusing because Devonte Adams could return. And then if Devonte Adams plays, I have basically no clue how to project the snaps behind him. But I, I'm if Devonte Adams doesn't play, even if he does, I'm expecting kind of a return to normalcy amongst the pa- the Packers and, and so, uh, you know, kind of you. T- what, I'm missing the word, uh, not backup receivers, but uh, peripheral receivers. And maybe Alan Lazard has earned a bigger a spot in the game plan because, you know, he earned Aaron Rodgers' trust two weeks ago. He did have a bad drop last week, but I will expect kind of a return to normalcy for MVS and Geronimo Allison. All right. I mean, I look, I believe Andy Reid is like maybe the most underrated coach of the last two decades. But the Packers, if Matt Moore starts, the Packers win by more than a touchdown. Jersey That's what it is. We'll remember this for next week. All right. That's it for us. Uh, Pat, you can check out his rankings up on Roto World again to help you make those lineup decisions. You can check out Hayden's fantasy forecast column. It's just goodness each and every mm-hmm. week. Do it. Uh, Daigle and Hayden and myself will be back this Sunday for Roto World Live, noon Eastern, helping you set your optimal lineups, previewing games as well. That's twitch.tv slash Roto World, noon Eastern. I'm Josh. That's Hayden. That's the John Daigle. Ooh. Talk to y'all soon. Y'all almost got there. See ya.